Hi everyone, my name is Nikhat Patel. Uh, I'm a staff engineer for John Deere Intelligence Solutions Group. Um, and I've been given an opportunity to actually share uh, our John Deere Operations Center journey. And hopefully you like it. Let me begin with the John Deere history. John Deere has been uh, very well known in the manufacturing industries. They've been manufacturing agriculture equipment, uh, constructions, turf, and forestry. Uh, They're all, uh, all in other businesses as well. Just to coming back to the topic of John Deere Operation Centers. Uh, so John Deere Operation Centers belongs to the Intelligent Solutions Group. And uh, Intelligent Solutions Group is actually responsible for delivering the precision act technologies. Just to give a high overview of Intelligent Solutions Group, uh, if you look at the pictures, uh, there are two harvest combines, which is operating, imagine this is in a cornfield and they're operating each, uh, parallel to each other's. And they can actually operate for continuously for 10 to 18 hours uh, and uh, combine uh, the cards. Uh, these are all things is possible uh, with the some of the precision like technologies that uh, ISG's group has been developing. Uh, a couple of them are, uh, one example is the, if you look at the right top, um, this is a st called Starfire receiver. Uh, these Starfire receiver, depending on the model, they are they can actually give a 2.5 centimeter precision, which is a kind of an, a very, uh, very accurate. Uh, there's also some other technologies like RDK Tower is also responsible for location accuracy. Uh, there are a couple of apps, uh, mobile apps, uh, there are web apps. Uh, all of these are actually kind of in a, making an operation center suite. Uh, there are also uh, uh, displays, which is actually part of the inside the machine. Uh, so in the inside the machine, there's an, a cab and there's a, uh, in the cab, uh, there are displays, uh, which is responsible for complex maneuvers as well. So ISG is responsible for delivering the overall precision uh, uh, agriculture technologies. So coming back to the operation center portion of it, um, John Deere Operation Center has uh, multiple applications and uh, there have been uh, different applications based on the different personas. So to deliver a different uh, business cases, uh, there have been, there are too many applications. There are uh, there are like a farmers. There's an agronomist. There's a contractor and dealers, and uh, support each one of them. Uh, there's an e different different tools are available, and operation centers actually deliver that. Now going to the uh, ten thousand over ten thousand feet overview because that's a too many applications, and uh, that many applications is actually utilizing a lot of different technologies. So you can imagine there's an, uh, it begins with the user story and then you commit your application code into GitHub and then it kicks off the uh, CI pipelines and then depending on the uh, pipeline, you might be actually creating a uh, cloud infrastructures or you might be doing a uh, compliance things or you might be releasing your artifacts. Let me talk about the John Deere's uh, operation center application architectures. I Means uh, it's a more typical arch architectures where you have a front end and back ends for delivery of web apps. Uh, but in uh, John Deere cases, we also had in a core API. So basically, we picked up the uh, BFF model, which is in a back end as in front end. So we have a multiple apps uh, which can deliver their own uh, server core based API wrapper to actually deliver the core API. So core APIs get delivered to the server core and then they wrap it up and then uh, front end, they deliver it to front end in the manner that the front end application is supposed to be delivering it. So uh, we we actually got server core, UI core, and uh, we also had an applications, uh, which is an additional repository is to be wrapping up the server and the UI core. Now, uh, the reason behind the application was because we didn't have an UI core having a separate pipeline because we were using an Elastic Beanstalk EC2 base application. In that case, is where our UI content was getting delivered from the application, it means EC2. Uh, in that case, is it means we had to go with the three parts approach. Now, uh, 
there are problems with the three parts. I means tripods is actually, I means if you have a small chain, you have to do, do a bumping. Uh, it's in a bump train. And basically it's also creating a longer deployment cycles. So to address the longer deployment cycles, uh, we actually went with the bipods approach. And the bipods is more where we actually get rid of the applications uh, wrapper and uh, made the UI have its own pipeline. And that it was able to possible because of the uh, using the CDN and the S3 structure, uh, we were able to actually deliver the separate UI content. So technically, uh, UI had in a separate pipeline and the server core now actually can run, have uh, their servers EC2 is running separately and it's in a separate pipeline and we can run uh, our web application delivery. Now, it's in a much more efficient way where we don't have in a longer deployment cycles because uh, if you have in a UI core changes, it's just changing on the UI core. Now, it does impact on the uh, uh, testing sites because uh, small changes on UI core needs to be tested on the different server core side of it as well. So it actually given us an uh, opportunity to actually enhance it with uh, more test coverage. And that's more a natural because when you have an isolated applications, you write more tests and a pact and a contractual making in a contract is becomes a much more a motivations here. And uh, technically, if we have an isolations and if you write a more test, basically you are actually exercising your TDD process. And in the TDD process, basically you're gonna be writing your specs. So you're gonna ask more questions to the business and finding more right answers to the applications. In earlier, that boundary wasn't clear, but in the BIPOS structures, that boundary is much more clear. So it make that happen. And it makes your applications more, uh, robust enough to actually deliver and make it more sustainable as well because uh, if you don't find any requirement gaps basically you're delivering and uh, continuously shipping things now uh, bipods is a uh, two part structures whereas uh, in some cases we found out that uh, it doesn't mean uh, it's not much efficient where we have to actually always use a server core because this is in a bff model Monopar approach can actually make more sense in the some uh, particular other business cases, like in the support tools, where you don't care about the um, the, the the wrapping your APIs and making in a uh, different APIs output to the front end. You don't care about those things. In the Monopar structures, you can actually call to directly to the API, the core API, and then you can deliver things, and which is much more efficient because you only have a one thing to care about, which is the UI core. The most of the core APIs are already built up because that's an, uh, uh, basically they are uh, the core APIs and uh, your application delivery is uh, just an, uh, depending on your support tool delivery. I mean, those are support tools are a little bit separate. So where you don't need an a server core. So you actually save some cost plus uh, you actually, from the maintenance perspective, it's a smaller changes. So it's a kind of an, a win-win situation. So depending on your business case, it actually helps us out. So that's what we had in our journey. So um, here's the, like, this is like, it started from the tripods, uh, it went to the bipods, and then uh, it's moving towards the monopods. So we are still not there yet um, in terms of the, uh, uh, where we want it to be. But it's depending on uh, different other technologies getting moved, uh, we will be having in a more progression over that patterns. Now, coming back to the, uh, let's uh, like, uh, let's uh, dig into the, our application. So let's build in a web applications and uh, find out like what's happening there. Now there's an, uh, to actually understand it much more better, we actually need to think about from the foundational breaks, like on a, so we divide into a different layers and that layers actually helps out in understanding uh, how the progression is moving, how we are emerging uh, from a different patterns. Uh, so let's uh, first talk about the authentication layer. So pretty much everybody might be aware of the authentications is, I mean, uh, you might be starting in a basic auth and then you have an OAuth 1.0a and then you move to the, it means there's an OAuth 2 standards and there's an AWS 4 tokens if you're utilizing the AWS infrastructures. Um, there are also JARs, uh, so, and uh, also an MFA tokens. Now, 
one cool thing about the jars is uh, jars are a much more nicer in compared to the OAuth 1 structures uh, where it's in a token. Tokens are always without the context and they don't have any good information. So you have to actually go and look it up uh, that, that this is the person. In the case of jars, uh, that information is already there, but you actually decrypt it with the keys, which is you already have with your application. So technically, jars are making more applications more stateless in compared to the uh, in OAuth one natures, it was more stateful because you're going to be uh, you need in a, some kind of a state manners to keep your token lookups to store your sessions. So the session storage is something which is on OAuth one nature, uh, which goes away with the uh, JSON tokens, which is uh, you can actually use in OAuth two as well with the JSON web tokens. So it's a kind of a progression there. Uh, there are multi-factor authentication tokens as well available, but it depends on the business cases where you wanted to utilize a second factor. Now, coming to the next where, so this is how the, emer the patterns are emerging on the authentication layer. So you have an web apps where you have an OAuth course, which is integrated into your applications. And then uh, that application means it's in a, where you actually write an OAuth core here. Now, Using in a cloud infrastructures, um, there are like an load balancers, which is allowing you to enable with the OIDCs. So OpenID Connect, uh, that it's actually helping you out in terms of uh, delivering your OAuth. So technically, if you wanted to, means if you use an ELB with the OIDCs, then you're actually delivering your application more, more efficiently because your OAuth log logic, which is in the application is gone. And you can actually, uh, means you should be aware of that uh, there is a problems with the OAuth cores. So you don't have to worry about your security issues uh, because your security has been managed by the load balancers. So it's a kind of a win-win situations where uh, it becomes much more uh, beneficial. Plus uh, the other benefit is uh, your application load balancers actually making your applications more uh, stateless because uh, in a stateful nature, you have to manage the, your tokens and your sessions and so on. Uh, whereas in the ALB uh, structures, you don't have to manage your session because session is getting managed by your load balancers. And that's the, one of the big advantage over it. And these are all applicable to the biopods. Uh, and uh, there is an, a third option that actually emerged, which is uh, called Pixie. So Okta has been developing an authorization core flow with the Pig Z, and this is kind of a very recent uh, emergence. Uh, these applications, I means uh, web apps can actually have an uh, authentication happen on the client sides. So far in the previous two generations, we used to have like an, a server uh, having an, a responsible for authentication token generations in the Pig Z natures you actually generate at the client level. So basically you generate at the client browser level and you don't even call to the server side of it. Now it does actually works very well in the monopod structures and it actually becomes much more efficient in terms of the cost as well because you're not gonna be maintaining server. And so there's a more win-win situations, but there are some security things that something we, we haven't actually talked about here, but there are some issues, so that's why um, we haven't been using it, but I'm pretty sure I mean, they're gonna be actually patching up and browser is gonna be actually more intense at some point and uh, we'll be able to use the Pixies in, even in the uh, future emergence. There are also uh, MFA's updates as well, like browsers now getting supports of the MFA factors uh, with the along with the signatures, Google has been trying to do that. I think uh, that emergence is gonna move in the progressions and that will emerge it uh, to support two factors much more efficiently. Let's talk about the compute layer. <clears throat> so from the early back in days, uh, it used to be managing by the single EC2 instances and uh, it was a much more pain because you have to have in a big instances. Um, there was no clustering concept. And then eventually the clustering concept happens to be uh, making more sense and then multiple EC2 instances uh, making a more cluster and then a cluster is managing your server loads. Now, 
uh, Docker has changed a little bit uh, from there because EC2 hosts were resource, means utilizing the resources and making the containers actually saves that resources. It means it actually helps out uh, not actually doing any resource utilization at that level and to actually get in a more bare metal a power of it and so industries has been moving from multiple containers on the cluster side of it and then uh, they move to the next level where the container is in serverless like in a ECS Fargate is a good example where you don't have to actually define the uh, the, you don't have to define the EC2s, means you don't have to actually update your um, EC2s, means there's no EC2s, it's just in a computer and uh, the, uh, the disk that you want. So it's actually uh, developed uh, the managed versus unmanaged services where it's becoming in a more like a, uh, your cloud provider is actually managing a lot of stuff. And uh, it is also helping the businesses as well to deliver the products very quickly because uh, if you don't have to manage things, then uh, you can you don't have to worry about it. You don't actually spend more time on it. Uh, you deliver things much more quickly because you only focus on your business products. So, uh, so container and services is one of the good examples where I think I would say I means uh, we have been actually working more uh, towards that. Uh, and we also been seeing like in a different application. So in the operation center, some of the applications are using an EC2 based clusters. Uh, some are using a container base, like serverless base, and some are in the function serverless. But it depends on the business cases because the function as in serverless is something where a monoforce works very well and uh, they deliver things much, uh, much more better efficiently. Uh, but like it's more of a business case oriented because like in a support tools, like support tools works very well with the FRAS model because you don't have to actually worry a lot of things. You don't have to do anything means you can actually opt out things means you don't have to do manage your containers. Now containers and serverless has also one another benefit is uh, you can have an isolations and which is sometimes an important things like you can isolate your application from other applications and uh, that is much becomes much easier to actually support it. If you wanted to support that in the EC2 level, there is an additional overhead that has to be taken on. So that's where the uh, the, the 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 boundary is, and uh, it depends on the business cases where do you want to actually rely on it. Now um, let's talk a little bit more on the containerization. So this is what we have seen it on the containerization. So like um, we like the I means. Uh, small web apps, I think we believe in um, uh, more uh, lower complexities and we like the ECS, uh, EC2 and ECS targets. Uh, ECS target more suited on the web app isolation po uh, point of view, whereas EC2, ECS is more a little bit complex for us because uh, because we have also DRI security groups and stuff like that. So technically it depends on your organization as well. Uh, but in terms of uh, web applications, web application doesn't need an, a Kubernetes means, um, unless until like you have an, a, a team which is maintaining Kubernetes, you should uh, you should have a, then then you should be a good. Otherwise, means maintaining an, a Kubernetes on a one single silo team, uh, that's an, a too uh, too much to ask. I think I haven't talked to a lot of other topics. Um, so each topic has its own story. Um, so if you have uh, something uh, that might interest you, if you want to talk about it, uh, talk about it, please let me know. Now, uh, if you want to check out the, our Precision Act Technologies webpage, please go and go to this particular link. Uh, there's our cool uh, uh, informations are available, means uh, how we actually doing the Precision Act Technologies. And if you look at this particular picture, this is a, one of the example as well. Uh, these are not in a, a manual uh, driven row plantings. These are uh, machine planted uh, rows. And uh, you can see that they are actually too precise that the curve is actually happening like that. Thank you.